Merry Christmas, everybody. You know, I got to get something out of the way right off the top in case you are curious and incredibly observant. Yes, Pastor Ryan and I have on the exact same shirt today. It happens. And if you're wondering, you can purchase one. Also, we got them at a store called Forever 51. So there you go. So as you can imagine, I spent a lot of time thinking and um, working on the idea of Christmas. And it turns out if you go back and look at the very first Christmas that we can read about, and Jesus was born about 2000 and some years ago, and then every Christmas since then, there's actually a thread of consistency across all of those 2000 plus years. You see, every single Christmas that has ever happened always involves a search. Y'all have been searching for something, right? Y'all have been searching for that perfect thing for your life. You've been searching for that perfect thing for someone else who's in your life. Maybe you are hoping that that someone in your life is searching for the thing that you want them to be searching for. Some of us, we, we've been searching for about a month now. Some of us, maybe six, eight weeks. Some of us, we started our search back in July because we're super organized. And some of us, if we're honest, we're about to search in 30 minutes. We're going to begin <laughs> our search. But there was searching going on back in the very first Christmas. Herod was searching for the Christ child this little boy called Jesus. Zechariah, a man who we're going to talk about in just a bit, he was searching for the return of his voice. He actually lost his voice for a good long while. Mary and Joseph, as we know, there was no room in the inn. They were searching for a place to stay. But we have an advantage today, if you think about it, when it comes to searching, because I believe almost all of us, whenever we are searching or hunting or really, really looking for something, where do we all go? We go to Google, don't we? You just Google it. It's become its own verb. It's replaced the word search. And they didn't have Google back then. But could you imagine if they did have Google back then? If Herod would have said, where is the Christ child? Maybe he would have found Jesus really, really quickly. Or maybe he would have landed himself in his search in another part of the world because the name Jesus or Jesus is popular elsewhere throughout the world. Think about that. You think about Zechariah as he searched for the return of his voice. Maybe he would have found um, directions on how to start a podcast or information on how to prepare a hot toddy because that helps whenever you lose your voice. Mary and Joseph, no doubt, they would have landed on vrbo.com and found themselves a nice five-star accommodation complete with hot tub out back. We turn to Google anytime we are searching and we have an advantage. I spent a lot of time on Google this year and I actually bumped into something unique. They have an analytic that you can use. It's called Google Trends. And it actually can reveal, get this, everything that you and I are searching for. You can literally get a snapshot of what we're searching for. That's absolutely phenomenal. I was like Alice in Wonderland. I went down the rabbit hole. It's crazy, interesting, but it's also a little bit scary. I took time to really hone in and say, for the last 30 days, here in Pittsburgh, what are Pittsburghers Googling? What has what our searches been aimed toward? The very first thing on the list, the number one thing that Pittsburghers are searching for in the last 30 days, I'm wondering if you can guess it. We Google the Pittsburgh Steelers. Come on, right? We love the Steelers. I love the Steelers. How about that win yesterday? Absolutely amazing. We love the Steelers and we're consumed with the Steelers. Number two on the list, Pittsburghers search a lot for Amazon because we also love to shop. We love the idea of get it here in two days, prime delivery. You don't have to fight traffic. You don't have to cross a bridge or go up and down hills. They'll bring it right to your doorstep and text you a picture of it outside your door. We love the Steelers. We love Amazon. And what we search for is actually revealing of who we are, isn't it? Number three on the list, Google Trends said Pittsburghers in the last 30 days searched for the weather. Think about that. Here in Pittsburgh in December, everybody's looking for a sunny day, aren't we? bring a little hope to our lives. And number four is where the list got incredibly interesting to me. The fourth most popular thing that we have searched for in the last 30 days, we went to Google and we Googled Google. I'm just gonna let that one rest for a second. Like a turkey on Thanksgiving, you gotta let it rest. We Googled Google. Searches reveal something about us. That turns out, and it tells me that Pittsburghers, we still don't know how to use the internet, do we? <laughs> Those commercials, we're becoming just like our parents. It's happening. 
Number five on the list. Also very interesting. I thought this was redundant, but then I dug deeper. Number five on the list, searching in Pittsburgh the last 30 days, the NFL. And I'm like, why are we searching that? Turns out there's some subheadings, subcategories. The first subcategory was the playoffs because everyone wants the Steelers to make the playoffs. We want to know what are their chances? What are the percentages? But second subheading was Miles Garrett, professional football player for the Cleveland Browns. Searches reveal something about us. Turns out if we don't make the playoffs, we always can blame Cleveland for it, can't we? (laughs) It's who we are in Pittsburgh. Our searches reveal something about us. They tell us something about us. What are you searching for? Not not just like, what are you maybe going to bump into and maybe purchase it, but what are you, what are you really hunting down? What are you longing for? What are you intensely hoping to desire to acquire or add to your life? This year, we do it all the time. We make Christmas lists. I don't know what's on your list, what's driving your search. Perhaps for some of us, it's something to wear. Maybe those pair of Uggs that are hot this year and you can't seem to find them. Maybe they're a pair of midnight blue Jordan 3s that happen to drop on December the 16th. I'm asking for a friend. (laughs) Maybe for some of us, our search is some form of entertainment. Maybe some new headphones. Maybe a new television. Maybe a new gaming system. Maybe something that you don't have and you want to add it to the entertainment arsenal at home. Maybe some of us, our search is about what other people are searching for us. We're hoping they come up with the green stuff, some cash or the perfect gift card because we like some options when it comes to spending our money. Maybe for you, your search is about a trip or an experience. You want to do something new in your life. Or speaking of something new, maybe your search is for someone new. Or maybe your search is a little bit different. Maybe it's deeper and more internal. Maybe you're searching for some answers to some questions. Because life has been hard, painful, and confusing. Have you ever paused and looked beneath the surface of our searches? Because the longer we look for something, the more intensely we desire to find or acquire or experience something, there has to be something deeper down in our soul or in our hearts driving that. There's a why behind our searches. If you think about it, the things we're searching for, they're like a window deep into our soul and our hearts and the constructions of our very being. Our searches are a revelation of our needs. We have needs in our life and we feel like if I can just get the right clothes, well, then I'll be accepted because everyone needs to be accepted. We have a need for joy in our life. So our search is always on the lookout for something more entertaining because our current version of entertainment, it just doesn't get us there anymore. And we need joy. We need significance in our life. Some of us turn and search for relationships. Some of us turn and search for experiences because we have these needs in our life and we think and believe that if we get the right thing, it'll scratch that itch finally. But does it ever? Come on, last year you searched for very similar things. Are those needs gone? Don't you still deeply long for significance in this world? Aren't you deeply desiring to be accepted by people in this world? Aren't you deeply needing and wanting some measure of security? Because it seems like more and more anymore, life is crazy and everything is changing all the time. Searches are a revelation of our needs, but our searches are endless, aren't they? It's like we're hamsters on a wheel running and running and running. It's almost like digging in sand. If you've ever been to the beach, you know what that's like. You dig a hole and you keep digging. You think, I'll get somewhere to where it's solid and I can stand on that. But the sand just keeps filling back in and you keep digging and digging and digging. And here we are searching and searching and spending and acquiring and searching. I went through my phone this year. I was in my notes app. I was about to make a list for this year's Christmas. And guess what I bumped into? Last year's Christmas list. And everybody got what they were searching for. And yet here we are again, 365 days later, searching. Have we ever paused and asked if we even know how to search the right way? Maybe the world-renowned philosopher was right. Bono said, we still haven't found what we're looking for. I told you Google Trends was a bit of a rabbit hole for me. I spent 
a lot of time. I'm not going to tell you how much time on there. And I bumped into something where it turns out year after year after year, people tend to Google the top five questions over and over and over again when it comes to Christmas. The first thing people that turn to, turn to Google to ask and seek an answer to is Google, how many days are there until Christmas? Get a calculator, right? Search for a calculator because you just have to do 25 minus however many days it is in December. Why do you turn to Google for that thing? It's interesting how we behave. And then the second thing that we ask Google when it comes to Christmas, not just how many days until Christmas, we go just like a little bit further down the insanity path. Google, when, ac when actually is Christmas? It's the 25th every year, isn't it? Like I have to search Easter because it moves. It's a rotating holiday and we have services and it's always like on the run. But Christmas is pretty predictable every year to the 25th. Like maybe you don't need a calculator, you need a calendar and just look at it, right? There it is there. The third thing that people Googled, amazing stuff. Google, what do I want for Christmas? <laughs> you turn into Google for that advice. It's funny to me. The fourth thing that people Googled when it comes to Christmas, questions on their mind. Google, how do I actually decorate a Christmas tree? You just decorate it. You just grab those paper clippy things and your ornaments and you just put it on the tree however you want. It feels really simple, right? But then I thought about it. I get it. There are some people in this world who know and believe and are convinced that there is a right and perfect way to decorate their tree and they will silently and maybe even sometimes loudly take your place decorations and move it to the right place while staring at you. I want you to know if you're that person, I'm seriously praying for your soul. The fifth thing, how do I draw a Christmas tree? And I identify with that one because I can't draw a Christmas tree. They're always wonky and it's a weird shaped triangle every single time I do it. These questions are fascinating to me, specifically number three. Google, what do I want for Christmas? You know, on the surface, that seems really silly, doesn't it? But what if it was really, really wise? I mean, come on, we're searching all our lives. And we still haven't found what we're looking for. Maybe we do need some outside advice to help us with our search. Maybe we don't really know what we want. Maybe we're not the best judge of what's best for us. You know, it's interesting when you open up the scriptures and when you take a look at God giving us a description of the birth of his son, Jesus, the Christ child, God answers that question for us. He lets us know that in this baby boy, his son, born in a manger, who left heaven is everything we want and everything we need. Jesus truly is an end to all of our searching. We've been looking in this series at the words of a man named Zechariah. He lost his voice if you know the story of Jesus' birth. And the very first words are, are the driving thought of this series, remember and be thankful. Luke recorded his words, and here's what Zechariah said. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited, we talked about that two weeks ago, and he's redeemed, we talked about that last Sunday here at Northway, his people. And here's where we're going to focus today on Christmas Eve. God has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David. So here's God, the very first Christmas. He knows our searching. He sees our digging. He watches the little hamsters running and running and running and never getting where they hope to get. And he says, I have everything they want and everything they need. Here you go. Here's a horn. Merry Christmas. If you've read the Christmas story like me, I can't tell you how many times I've breezed over these words and thought, that's really weird. Let me, let me just get to the Magi. Can I just get to the angel and the swaddling cloths and the manger and the frankincense, gold and the myrrh? But yet here we are, God declaring the very first moment a man can re-speak again a prophecy. Words from God describing the gift of his son, Jesus, and he called him a horn of salvation. See, to us, this doesn't feel like a big deal. When I think about a horn, I think about some instruments that I have no business even looking at, let alone trying to play, because I can't play music. When I think about a horn, I think about an old department store that used to be here in Western Pennsylvania, horns. Or maybe some of you are a little more rural, trader horns. Some of you remember that one. 
When I saw the word horn and I was looking at this, I thought, man, my wife tells me, lay off the horn when you drive. Why do you use that so much? I wasn't thinking about Jesus. And yet here is God saying, my son is the horn of salvation. You see, to us, this doesn't feel like a big deal. It doesn't seem real relevant, but to Zechariah and his audience back then, this was everything they were hoping for. This captured everything they wanted and everything they needed. This is something to always remember and be thankful for. You see, back then they would understand that a horn was a symbol of strength. Animals who had horns like this were often very victorious in battle. They were the top of the food chain. And so a horn was a symbol of strength. We all want strength because strength, that'll make you significant in this world. Not only are, uh, are, is the horn a symbol of strength, but it's also a symbol of acceptance. If someone went to battle, mano y mano, think David and Goliath, oftentimes what they would do is they'd give the victor a trophy and the trophy was a horn from a strong animal. And if you had a trophy, you never had to buy your own lunch or your own next dinner because everyone accepted and loved you. A horn was a symbol of everything we want, significance and acceptance. And it's also a symbol of security. Did you know that the word horn and our idea and image of a crown, those words are connected in their original etymology? kings and queens would wear crowns that were made up of horns. And if you have a crown, you're secure. You're not worried about a job. You're in charge. See, to the people Zechariah was talking to, they saw in the Christ child a symbol and picture of significance, acceptance, and security, everything they were already searching for. And then came Jesus and he lived his life. And then he went to the cross and he died. He was crucified for us. He died for us. He rose again. But, but the idea of dying for us, when's the last time someone died for you? Like you're pretty significant if I lay my life down for you. And Jesus did that for us. Jesus died and the scriptures tell us that, that the way we can be restored with God the Father is through faith. We all get in the same exact way. It doesn't matter how tall you are. It doesn't matter how athletic you are. It doesn't matter how rich you are. It doesn't matter how good you are or have been. We all get in the same way. And the Bible tells us we don't have to clean up before we get in. We just show up with faith and we believe in Jesus and we become sons and daughters of God, just like Jesus is. Talk about acceptance. And this relationship, this connection of sons and daughters, it lasts forever all eternity. That's security. Right there in Jesus. Everything you've been searching for. Significance, acceptance, and security. The search is over. But God didn't stop there. God saw all of our wants. He knows how we're wired. He understands what's behind our search, but he sees even deeper that. And he knows that beyond our wants... You and I, we have needs. We need something big, and it's the same thing for every single one of us. This past fall, we spent time studying Exodus chapter 20. It's the Ten Commandments where God gives his top 10 list. And right after the Ten Commandments, if you read a little further in Exodus, when you get to 25, 26, 27, you see God starting to give Moses, the leader of Israel, some instructions on what worship looks like. How are you going to function as a people when it comes to your, your worship services? And in Exodus chapter 27, God gives Moses very specific instructions on how to build what was known as the altar of sacrifice. He was very clear because this would be the altar where animal blood would be shed for the forgiveness of the people's sin. Blood would literally be spread out on this altar and shed on behalf of the people to atone or pardon them from their sins. And what's interesting about this is as God is giving Moses the instructions, he tells him, check it out, this is a picture of what it looks like to put a horn just like this on all four corners for the blood to be shed and spread on all four corners. Now fast forward to the New Testament in Zechariah and he says, Jesus is the horn of salvation. Jesus lived a spotless, perfect life. And then he was crucified on the cross. 
And he shed his blood for the atonement of our sins. It was said back in the Old Testament that if someone was guilty, if they expected a consequence, if they had shame in their life and they needed a pardon, if they could at least make their way to the, to the, the altar of sacrifice, if they could grab a hold of that horn, it literally happens in Scripture that the consequence was spared or postponed, that they received a pardon until they experienced a full trial. Do you see the dots connecting? See, our greatest need is that we all sin. Every single one of us, myself at the front of the line, we all fall short of the glory of God. Sin is whenever we live our lives in a way that's inconsistent with God's laws. And the Bible tells us that unfortunately there is a consequence to sin. It's called death. That death is a picture of separation from God. That's because God is holy and sin is unholy and holy and sin, they can't mix. They don't play well in the sandbox together. But then came Jesus. He died and took upon himself all of the sins for all of humans throughout all of history to be a pardon for us. It's like God is saying, here's the horn of salvation. Just reach out and grab it and hold on to it. And your greatest need will be taken care of. Your sin can be pardoned forever. Turns out the horn of salvation is not just a little inconsequential term in our way as we try to head to the good stuff in Luke chapter 2. Turns out the horn of salvation is a picture of Jesus who meets all of our wants and provides for all of our greatest needs. In Christ, as a child of God, John says that Jesus came so that all would believe in him would have the right, full rights to be called and named a child of God. There is nothing we can buy or search for or acquire in this world that can give us the status of significance and acceptance and security and the pardon from our sins that a child of God can, that title can give us in this world. And it all is found through Jesus, the horn of salvation. And God is saying, here's the gift. Reach out and grab it and hold on. And your search can end. In Luke chapter 2, when the angel shows up on the scene, it's a passage of scripture we read all the time. The angel said, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all of the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, the horn of salvation who's Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with like a party from heaven, an angel, a multitude of the heavenly host. And they were praising God saying this, glory to God in the highest and on earth, all of earth, peace among those with whom God is pleased. You know, at, at the surface level, at the very, very root level, like surfaces our wants, significance, acceptance, and security. And then below that are our, is our needs, like forgiveness of sins. And then even deeper below that, you know what we're all longing and looking and hoping to find in this earth? It's peace. It's an end to the anxiety. It's a calming and quenching of the storm. It's a finality to the fear. It's a period on the uncertainty. And God said, you can have peace. It's found through Jesus. Yet many times we get tripped up with these exact words because we think we have to be pleasing to God in order to have peace. It feels like this is a cruel joke. God is saying, yeah, I'll give you peace, but you've got to please me. And we all know none of us can please God because all of us are imperfect. But here's the beautiful thing about Jesus being the horn of salvation. It's the simple truth that he is our horn of salvation. So we don't even have to try to be that. God is already pleased with his son, Jesus. And when we reach out our hand and grab the horn of salvation, when we believe in Jesus as our savior, when we receive the gift of Christ, the Bible tells us if we simply confess with our mouth, 
that Jesus is Lord. And if we believe in our heart that God truly did send him to earth and he raised him from the dead, then we will be saved. We will know peace right now. You don't have to please God. Jesus did that for you. He's the end to all of our searching. You just got to reach out and grab the horn of salvation through faith. This Christmas, may we be people who always remember Jesus as our horn of salvation. And may we always, deep in our hearts, be thankful for him being the greatest gift ever given. Before we wrap our time today, I want to give you an opportunity if you have never professed your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord. I want to give you an opportunity to reach out and grab the horn, to experience pardon, forgiveness, atonement for your sin, to receive the right to be literally called for the rest of your life a child of God, to be significant now, to be accepted now, to be secure now and forevermore because that's what God's children always are. Would you bow your heads with me across this room? Close your eyes. Give some privacy in this moment. And if that's you, if you want to place your faith in Jesus Christ, if you've never done so, if you want to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, if you want to believe in your heart and become a child of God, if you want to know peace on earth right now, just raise your hand so I can see it. Raise it up high. I see those hands. Raise them up high. Don't be ashamed. God's not ashamed of you. God loves you. He gave his best for you. Raise it up high. I see hands all across the room. Here's what I want you to do. If you raised your hand, I want you to pray this in your heart as I pray this out loud. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for giving me the horn of salvation. God, I confess with my mouth that Jesus is my Lord. I believe in my heart, God, that you sent him to die for me and that you raised him from the dead victorious over all of sin. And I today receive the forgiveness of my sins and peace on earth. Today, God, I am now a rightful heir, a child of God. Father, thank you so much for this gift. I love you, I praise you, and I pray it all in the horn of salvation name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. Hey, a lot of hands throughout the room. Can we congratulate and celebrate so many people? Absolutely incredible.